us come and be part of you. Aren't you glad for his presence? You know the one testimony I pray for out of the moment we're together? That we would all say, surely we've been in the presence of God. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me as we go to God's word? If you have a Bible in any form, turn to Psalm 136. We'll be there in just a moment. But would you bow your heads and let's just thank him right now. Father, we give you praise for who you are. You are God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Jesus, you're the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you call us friends. We thank you for your liberating grace. And sovereign spirit of God, we ask you to move and glorify the word of God today. And Lord, long after my words are forgotten, may your word remain. Would you just thank him right now, just before I say amen, would you just say, Lord, speak to me through your word. Take something from your word and make it spirit and life to my life. Lord, you come in and you change the room, Father, but you also change every room in us. I just feel like this morning the Lord is saying, hey, there's been some locked rooms inside of us. There's been some doors we haven't wanted to open, doors that need healing or deliverance, or comfort, doors that need repair, maybe even repentance, would you just say, Lord, I open, the, I open every door I know of right now to you. Would you come in, change the rooms in my soul today? We thank you for this. And Lord, we'd also be remiss not to pray for our nation on this important week. Lord, we ask you to have mercy upon our land. We thank you that the earliest women and men that came gave thanks to you. We also know, Lord, that ingratitude leads to rebellion and so many things that are contrary. So we ask, oh God, that you would be at work across our land, giving a spirit of thankfulness, reverence, and rejoicing in your presence. We give you praise now in Jesus' name. Would you say amen? Well, we're going to look at an ancient song of thanksgiving this morning in Psalm 136. And uh, my title today is Forever Grateful. And I just want to remind us that the, the psalmist here is thanking God for who he is. Just take a moment and think about who he is. Help me out a little bit. We need to be interactive this morning. What, what aspect of God are you grateful for just right now? Who he is. What makes you happy about the Lord today? In the midst of everything we're going through, what about God brings rejoicing to your spirit? Go ahead. Faithful. Mercy. Goodness. Love. Grace. Yes. Kindness. Patience. By the way, could we use more kindness and patience in our culture? By the way, everything St. Paul said about love is patient, love is kind, love... All of it starts with God. Amen? So we thank him for who he is. We also thank God for his mighty acts. God's not only infinite and intimate with us, but he does mighty things on our behalf. And we're going to look at that. And, uh, of course, with Israel, they're remembering the great deliverance from the Red Sea. And how many of you know, through the cross and resurrection, we were brought through as well. And so we want to praise him for his mighty acts and then we want to thank him for his merciful provision. And as we'll read the psalm together, you're going to see all these great and glorious things. And then the Lord also, it also says, and he gives food to every living creature. And we praise him for who he is. By the way, the Bible says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. It didn't say for everything. How many of you know there's things in our world that we're not thankful for? but we are thankful for who he is and that he's at work in every circumstance. Praise his holy name. So again, uh, what I'd like you to do with me as we, as, as we go to the next slide is I want, you to, I want you to join with me and I want us to join with ancient Israel and the church of all ages. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the part that's in regular print and then I want you to read with me, his love endures forever. And we're going to join with God's people over 3,000 years, reminding our soul of who he is. By the way, this word for his love endures forever, we could spend hours on that word. It means faithfulness, 
steadfastness, loyalty. Now, just a little humor here. Isn't it amazing how an athlete will sign a contract for $100 million for five years and then two years later saying, I'm not being paid enough? And they want to break a contract. A marriage gets tough. Well, I'm not realizing my potential. See you later. Folks, God doesn't ever break his covenant with us. No matter how far we stray, no matter how rebellious we become, how wounded life causes us to be, he will remain faithful. Amen? That's why other translations say his mercy endures forever. It all contained here. So help me out here. And we're, we're going to actually just spend a good time. And by the way, if you'd like to, would you stand for God's word for a moment? And you don't have to stand. Don't, don't make that hard on yourself. But you're welcome to stand. And let's, let's be a chorus. Let's be a choir today speaking God's word to each other. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone who does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. To him who, through it, who brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel through the midst of it, his love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, his love endures forever. Let's pause for a moment. Sometimes it, life's a wilderness, isn't it? He's still with us. Can you say amen? To him who struck down the great kings, his love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance, his love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel, his love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Can we give him praise this morning? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. God wants us to be thankful people. God is the creator, and he's also doing a new creation in us. He not only got it all started in the beginning, he was there in our beginning. As some of you know, we're very happy parents and grandparents. And um, you know one of the most fun, enjoyable things about being a grandparent is your kids calling you and saying, we're tired and this is work. And it's the greatest adventure of all. And it's the greatest adventure of all. But watching the fact yeah, we know, we know the science. We understand DNA and, and how, it, how life develops. But God is there, Psalm 139 says. He's there as we're shaped in our mother's womb. But 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. So he's the source of our creation, but he's the source of our new creation. Can you say amen? He's the Savior he brought Red Sea liberation, but he brings us resurrection life. In fact, later in the scripture, St. Paul will say, just as Israel, in a sense, was in, in a symbolic way, they were baptized through the Red Sea. So as we believe in Christ and we're baptized, we've come through and we're liberated to new life in him. And then God's a provider. I love the story in Israel. He brought manna from heaven. And it looked like it tasted really good, and then people complained that their diet wasn't varied enough. So he brought some quail later. But I love this because Jesus says, I am the bread of life who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. 
this is the God we're giving thanks to. This is the God we're giving thanks to. And so I want to just take a little time and unpack this a little bit with you of who he is and what he's doing. But as we do this, let me ask a question. What are we thankful for today? This is we spoke about God. What are you thankful for today? Just shout it out again, and we'll just praise God together for a minute. Grant, you're thankful for your grandkids. Okay. We're, we're, we're talking later. Okay. <laughs> Somebody else. Family. Health. Can we just pause on that? Because every one of us have experienced or, or may experience health challenges. Can we thank him for life and breath right now where we are? And can we also thank him there's a new body coming? Can you say amen? Oh, one day there's going to be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more aches and pains. Praise God. Can we thank him for that today? There's hope, isn't there? Even as we walk through the challenges. What else are we thankful for? Provision. Salvation. Thank you. Hope. Opportunity. So much to be thankful for. And can I just share a little paradox that I'm learning about every day? My, my, my wife and I created a phrase together, and I hope you'll remember this one. Um, and this is the phrase, life is a joyful or joyous lament sometimes. Every day there's a reason for joy and, and a reason for tears. I don't mean every day we have huge swings, but can we just be honest as we look at the world? There's a lot to be grieved about. Please pray for our friends in Colorado Springs. Amen? What a, what a, what a horrific moment as, as people are killed. And at the same time this morning, we woke up with life and breath for which we're grateful. A few years ago, we had a very challenging family moment. And the Lord gave my wife a picture that much of life is like an estuary. And that's a fancy word for where the beautiful sweet water of a river meets the sea water of the ocean. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but that estuary is where 70% of the life we get from the sea is born. God uses the joy and the lament, the great delights and the great challenges, and he brings life out of it. Can you say amen? Now, we don't always feel it or see it at the moment, but we're thankful, aren't we, that he can take all things and turn them for good. So I want to take a moment, as we're going to come back to those three points, but I want to remind us of our own country. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I am, I'm an actual historian. Some people say you're a relic. You can take your pick. <clears throat> but I, I teach history, and I've taught history for decades now. There's much about the American story that we can lament. But there's also much about the American story we can rejoice in. Because you see, history is a tapestry of narratives, not one side or the other. And can I just remind us, is it okay to remind us of good things? Those pilgrims who celebrated the first Thanksgiving were met by a Native American who spoke English named Squanto. Squanto had been taken into slavery, brought back to England, escaped to Spain, heard the gospel, and was baptized and made his way back to his native land. How would you like, here you are, literally pioneering, setting foot on soil you're not sure of. A few fishermen had gone before, you knew sort of where you were, but you landed north of where you expected. And you're met by someone dressed completely different, you're expecting no communication. It'd be like us walking into Paris, France, and have, having somebody going, how y'all doing? Or going down to Mexico City and having somebody say, bonjour. In other words, they were completely stunned by meeting someone who spoke their language. By the way, Squanto also taught them how to grow crops that would be sustainable, taught them where to find edible food. And though they had lots of privation and a large percentage died of disease, they survived because of the provision of a man named Squanto. 
By the way, he died only about 18 to 20 months after he met the pilgrims. And he died faithful, confessing Jesus and asking for prayer. Can we thank God for Squanto? We need to thank God for that. We need to thank God for many for the great awakening in our country that occurred from before our revolution all the way into the 19th century. There were a series of revivals and awakenings. And what made these unique is they weren't only people in church rejoicing. They led people to make a difference in the world as well. Missionary movements, anti-slavery movements, educational movements, reform movements came out of people transformed by the grace of God. If you've heard of the Methodist movement with John and Charles Wesley was born in this moment. At one point, they helped to bring an end to slavery throughout the British Empire. And they also helped to inspire our colonies and inspire our new nation to live lives of righteousness. We've had prophetic voices for love and justice throughout our history. In fact, you may not know this, but in, it was in the 1840s and 1850s that church-going sisters got together and said, I think we need the vote. They were all church-going sisters married with children. They said, it'd be a good thing. And about 75 years later, our sisters got the vote. And by the way, sisters, I'm glad you have the vote. Amen? But it was God's people that started that process. And then we've had revivals. You know why we've had so many revivals in America? Because we have so many rebels. We need revival. We need God to show up, and as we've sung, to change the room, to change the rooms in our hearts, and to change the neighborhoods that we live in. God has been present in the American story. By the way, right now I could take you to Zambia, and they would tell you that God's present in their story as their new president loves Jesus Christ with all his heart. I can take you to other areas of the world where the gospel has gone, and they feel that God's working in their nation as well. Can we thank God that he's working in every place where people call out to him? So I'll never say America's a chosen nation. What I will say is God's chosen people have often made America a great nation. We've been a nation that's welcomed and sometimes closed doors to people. We've been a nation needing revival and then a nation that through revival has brought righteousness and I think it's right to thank God for the good things today. And I hope you're also praying with me for all that needs to change. Amen? Can I hear an amen? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, we have, we have so far to go, and yet God's been faithful through it all. So let's look at these three things. First of all, let's talk about thanking God for who he is. For who he is. What I love is that we serve a God who is our infinite and intimate Lord. In Isaiah 57, 15, the Lord says, I dwell in the highest of heavens and with the humble of heart. Wow. He's far above space and time. Can we, can we agree that God is never caught by surprise, that he is sovereign? Amen? And he's right with us in every circumstance. Another way to put this is he's a God of providence and a God of passion. It's very important that we not lapse into fatalism. Oh, God's in control. Everything that happens is fine. No, no. Yes, God is God, and he's with us in every good and bad circumstance. He's with us and weeping when we're suffering, and he's with us and dancing over us with joy when we're rejoicing. He's infinite and intimate. And some of us need to remember that today. That God is all-powerful and he's passionate. He's concerned and he's compassionate. And God is, is also, in Jesus Christ, he's our sovereign servant. Mark 10, 45, one of the most important verses in all of Scripture after three chapters of the disciples arguing who was the greatest, three chapters, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, Jesus three times tells the disciples, get your act together. He finally says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve 
and give his life a ransom for many. You can add this, you can add John 13, verses 1 to 6. Jesus knew he had come from God and was going to God, took off his outer garment, stripped to his inner garment, picked up a towel and a basin and began to wash the feet of his disciples. We serve a Lord who knows what it is to serve. Can we thank God for that? And by the way, to serve without expecting in return. You know what's really hard? Let's kind of make this really daily and practical. Isn't it hard when you give and give and give and feel like so few people appreciate it? Am I the only one that, okay, I'm the only one. No, no, if we're really honest, it's hard sometimes. It's just give and give and give. But guess what? Our sovereign, he records our tears on his scroll. Our sovereign has the books that will be open. Our Lord knows all that we do for his glory and the good of others. And as long as we let go of our expectations that we're owed something, we're going to have a life of fulfillment just as Jesus did. This is the God we serve, infinite and intimate, concerned, all-powerful and passionate, and a sovereign who serves. Praise his holy name. Would you take a minute with me? Can we just thank God for who he is? Lord, we just pause right now, and we thank you for who you are. Lord, my words can't say it sufficiently. We just speak your scripture back to you. Thank you, Lord, you're good. Thank you that you're powerful. Thank you that you really do know all things. Thank you that you are in heaven, Lord, and you're with the humble in heart. We just pause right now and say thank you for who you are. No matter what we feel or what we're in the midst of, you are powerful and you are present. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you say amen? Amen. By the way, the reason I pause like that is one of my mentors about 45 years ago said, it's a good thing to pray in God's word while you still remember it. And that's what I, one of the reasons I like to pause sometimes is just to let it get in our spirits, let it get inside of us. Well, let's also thank God for his mighty acts. This, this psalm and all the psalms declare that God is the creator. He brings, he brings order to the cosmos. He creates out of nothing, <clears throat> and then he also brings order. And we need to rejoice that he's the creator. Why is there something and not nothing? It's because of our almighty creator. And by the way, whether you like a young earth, an old earth, a middle earth, if you like Tolkien, whatever you like, how many of you know he's the creator? However old those galaxies may be, he's the creator and knows everyone by name. Folks, there's a billion, billion stars out there, and he knows them by name. He's the creator, and he brings order. One of the things, when I talk to skeptics and atheists, one of the things I just ask them, I don't get in, in, I get in robust debates, but one of the things I ask them is, why is there something and not nothing? Well, it's just all this, this flux and this multiverse, and they have all these wonderful speculative ideas, not all of which are all wrong, but... But why? Why is there anything at all? And with all of the problems and all of the difficulties of a fallen world, I take a moment to realize this is still my father's world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's the creator. He's also our redeemer, liberating us from bondage. I love this. He took Israel out of Egypt, destroyed Pharaoh's armies, brought them into a new place. And here's what's really stunning. Even before they took possession of the land, right after, right after he liberates them, and they're kind of on their way, and, 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 and the Ten Commandments are, you know, uh, the Ten Commandments of, have, um, are, are being bestowed, and God's setting the foundations. You know what the first activity he had them do, other than gather that manna and quail? first activity was he had a community art project called the Tabernacle. First thing, they built a portable place of worship to welcome his presence. Are you glad for his salvation this morning? You are the Tabernacle. We're the Tabernacle. 
and taking time to allow the beauty of the Lord to be felt and understood is so important. He's our redeemer. He's our savior, our deliverer, our liberator. And then he's always powerfully present. Philippians 2 says that he's at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's working. Yes, work out your salvation, not work for your salvation, but because you're saved, work together. Work out what it means in your life because God's working in you. By the way, am I the only one that feels like he gets caught every time he goes 66 miles an hour? (coughs) I just mean in life. I don't mean tickets. By the way, could, could you praise God for that? Praise God for those moments of conscience. Praise God for the fact that he, keep, that he reminds you with conviction of things that need to be right. But also praise God for his comfort, amen? He's present. He's a redeemer. He's always working. And by the way, take a little note here. His primary will in our life is character. See, I can tell you the will of God for your life this morning. <coughs> it's so powerful. No, I can't tell you who, what you may do tomorrow, but I can tell you the will of God, which is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, to go from glory to glory by faith to faith because he's given us grace upon grace. So when, when you're perplexed, when you're at a crossroads, when you're wondering what decision to make, seek God about that. He will show you. But first ask him, what are you doing in me, Lord? A year ago, I was laid off from a full-time position. And for the last year, God has made a way as I've worked with several organizations, continue to teach students, continue to help churches, and he's made a way for us. And but you know what the most important thing he's done in my life for the last year? Help me to love, trust, in some cases forgive, to even bless people I don't agree with. Are there a few people in our world you don't agree with, or am I the only one? In other words, what he's primarily concerned about for Kathy and Charlie, along with leading us and providing for us, and we can tell you he's faithful, but his primary concern is that continued transformation into the image of Jesus Christ. I hope I'm just a little more like Jesus. And when this season I'm in comes into a new chapter and I sense it's coming soon, he still wants me to be grateful and remember all the ways he was with me through every season. In 1984, we were just back from overseas missions work. I had started seminary and we had our first baby and I got laid off. Can I give you the good news? He was with us then. And I took a job I never expected I'd ever take and he turned that into a blessing. Oh, praise God, we're done with that lesson. Oh, no, 1987. We had to leave a difficult situation, go 3,000 miles across the country with $6 in our checking account. And we had very hard nine months. But can I tell you he's faithful? Oh, we've learned the lesson. Hallelujah. 1994. 1994, had to make another transition. Oh, we've learned it. 1998, 2008, and 2021, or 2022. He's faithful. I won't brag that I've always been perfectly faithful. I will boast that he's faithful, and he's merciful in his provision. Praise his holy name. And finally, we need to praise God for that merciful provision we've been speaking of. He provides our daily bread, and he's the bread of life. How many of you have prayed the Our Father prayer before? Give us this day our daily bread. Do you know what you're actually praying for? You're praying for a good economy, because unless that bread comes out of heaven, you buy it somewhere, or someone gives it to you. You know what you're praying for? You're praying for a grain harvest. You're praying that the mills will work. You're praying that the factories will work or the baker can have what she or he needs. You're praying for a good economy when you pray for your daily bread. Did you know when you pray for your daily bread, you're praying for everybody else as well? He's the provider. My wife, 
makes the best sourdough bread in the world and the best oatmeal bread and the best fregazzo bread. But I just had a sourdough roll for breakfast. Oh, are you hungry yet? I mean that perfect crust and that perfect soft center and the right butter. But the hands, her faithful hands to do that. By the way, she won't do it with a machine. I've offered no, no technology. I, th I think mostly because kneading it gets all her frustrations out toward me. But anyway, um, no, but seriously, folks, when you pray for our daily bread, you're praying for God to move in other people's lives. Can we thank him that he has seen and unseen protection? Amen? I think angels have worked overtime for people we pray for. You know, I shared that it was a little over a year ago that our son survived a 100-foot fall off of Horsetooth Mountain. It made the papers. In, in, in the Pudla area, it made the papers. He survived. He's not all the way back to church yet, but he knows God... God spared him. And we're thankful. But how many of you know, how many times have you just missed being hit by a car? How many times have things just happened a certain way? So there's unseen as well as seen protection from the Lord. Praise his holy name. And Hebrews says his angels are ministering spirits sent to the heirs of salvation. That's us. I'm not going to go speculating about angels. There's so many books out. Ignore, ignore all of them, please. The Bible says little, but what it says is important. They're under God's command, and they're for us. And yet sometimes we've also entertained them being unaware of it as well. Can we praise his holy name for protection? And finally, how about unexpected blessings? I told you about those transitional moments. So it's 1983. And we're back from Belgium, and we need a car. And in the mail comes a letter and a check from Saudi Arabia. People we have seen in Belgium were working in Saudi Arabia, were praying for us, knew that we needed provision from the Lord, and sent us sufficient money to put a down payment on a car. By the way, this is back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and the internet didn't exist. It took two weeks for the check to clear. But we got our little Honda Civic. And I could get to work and seminary, Catholic, we could get around because somebody heard from God in Saudi Arabia and sent a check to San Jose, California. Folks, we need to thank him for every daily blessing of bread and every unexpected blessing. And can I, can I give you an example of an unexpected blessing right now today? And that's your presence and your love for God and the presence of God in this beautiful place that we're worshiping in. I know he's here, but the presence of God is palpable in this place because you've been pursuing him all week and you bring your story together. And Kathy and I get to go from this place rejoicing because of his presence and the unexpected blessing of being part of this family. So I'd like, what I'd like us to do, just before we sing again, is I'd like us to pray out loud with our eyes open. Remember, we praise him for who he is. We praise him for all of his mighty acts. And now, and we praise him for his provision. But this is a prayer I'd like us, you can stay seated. And after this prayer, I'm going to say a final prayer, and then we're going to go out singing in thankfulness for his presence. Amen? Before I pray this prayer with you, I hope today your gratitude meter goes up just a little bit. I hope your thankfulness goes up just a little bit. And it can go up even in the midst, even in the midst of family members that need to come back to Jesus even in the midst of physical challenges and diagnoses that you receive, even in the midst of wondering what the economy is going to be. I was just in a conference that I helped to put together, and guess what? The economy is going to be different in five years than five years ago. Can I just let you know it's going to change? How many of you know he doesn't change? And that means he can help us change for work conti to continue. But whatever the circumstances, 
may you let your gratitude grow and your thankfulness grow. So share with me this, pr this prayer with our eyes wide open. Lord, thank you that is your love that creates, redeems, and provides for us. Lord, thank you that you are holy, far above the heavens, yet you meet us in our humility. Lord, thank you that you are the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you call us to unity with you and each other. Lord, we receive your grace and we rejoice in your goodness today. In Jesus' name, do I hear a loud amen? amen. Would you bow your heads one more time before we sing together? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we just take a moment to thank God, respond to his word, I just want to, I just feel led by the Spirit to pinpoint the fact that this call to thankfulness is hard when life is not fair or easy. We're not thankful for everything, but we are thankful in everything. And right now, let that word minister to your spirits this morning, saints. That afflicted relative, that difficulty in your body and spirit, that challenge at work, would you, would you begin to thank God that he is present and active and working in the challenges? Would you do that right now? Lord, we thank you. The hard places, and we all have them, Lord, the hard places, you're thankful. The prodigals in our families, Lord, the difficult difficulties at work, the, just the afflictions in a fallen world in our bodies, Lord, you're still with us and you're present. And we thank you for that. Lord, we also rejoice in hope today. Lord, one day there's going to be a new heavens and new earth where there is righteousness, peace, and joy in its fullness. Lord, we rejoice that one day we will worship and work in your presence with brand new bodies in a community where no one's competing and all are cooperating for the glory of God. Would you thank him for our the new heavens and new earth that's coming? Would you thank him right now? Lord, we thank you for that hope. We thank you for that hope that puts everything in perspective. And now, Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and help us bring foretastes of that future everywhere we go. Lord, help us in the midst of every challenge to welcome the future, to welcome peace, to welcome righteousness, to welcome joy into our work, into our families, into our neighborhoods. Lord, we thank you, your Holy Spirit, who is the down payment of the future, the guarantee of our inheritance. Holy Spirit, you're active. So, Lord, right now we open our hearts and hands and we say, activate your gifts all week in my life. Would you do that right now? Would you ask the Holy Spirit to activate his gifts right now in you? Lord, we just welcome right now all your gifts, wisdom, knowledge, discernment, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, faith, miracles, healing. We welcome all your gifts, Lord. Mercy and governance and teaching. Lord, we welcome all your gifts in all that we do all week. Praise your holy name. And just before I say amen and we sing together, would you pray for that person who needs to encounter Jesus? Would you bring a couple names to the Lord of people that need Jesus? Would you do that right now? Lord, we just bring to you family, neighbor, colleague. I bring to you my natural brothers, Lord, who need to encounter your grace. Would you name their names right now, quietly but verbally? Lord, it is your will that they be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth and the joy that you have for their lives. We thank you and we praise you, and we are forever thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you say amen? Stand with me in the presence of the Lord. And let's join with the team and let's go from here singing his praises. <laughs>